Things are going to get a little complicated in the coming years, and we're not going to need Avengers. We're going to need something else, something darker. Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine is on a familiar mission, making dramatic entrances after some superhero's rough rollout, and making vague future plans with other shady-powered people. We can only guess who she recruited from the Black Widow movie. With Fury in space, who else is on De Fontaine's list? If the team she's recruiting for is the Dark Avengers, then we have a scouting report for her in the upcoming MCU movies. Let's get started. The original Dark Avengers were the result of the big-brained idea to put Norman Osborn in charge of things after the secret invasion eroded faith in Tony Stark and Nick Fury. You could understand not trusting those two, but then to turn to Norman, I dress like a goblin and try to kill a teenager in a spider suit Osborn? Initially, his goal was to fill the roster with people loyal to him who would also fill the roles of the original members, who all rage quit when a supervillain was put in charge. Despite how swimmingly things went with Bruce Banner's self-experimentation, there is a whole cast of Gamma characters following in the Hulk's massive footprints. One of those is returning to welcome a fourth member of the Gamma family when She-Hulk premieres on Disney+, and that of course is Emil Blonsky, the Abomination. People who saw the Marvel one-shot The Consultant would know that Abomination was General Ross's pick for the Avengers program before Agent Coulson and Agent Sitwell, still pretending to not be Hydra, concocted a plan to send in Tony Stark in an effort to annoy General Ross and secure Banner over Blonsky for the Avengers initiative. It could be at the end of that series we'll get to see Dave Fontaine's Not For Walking Boots again. Iron Patriot is another character, sort of, that's already been introduced, sort of. Tony Stark was nothing if not a tinkerer, and he created dozens of variations of his flying armored suits. While he seemed pretty determined to keep that armored suit life to himself, it was only a matter of time before those around him started taking joy rides in older models. Most notably, of course, is his old pal Rhodey. In the comics, Rhodey takes over Iron Man duties while Tony deals with his demon in the bottle, and when the cool exec with the Heart of Steel returns, Rhodey eventually eventually gets his own ordnance-heavy War Machine suit. In the MCU, War Machine came about after a very condensed Demon in the Bottle sequence, and Rhodey flew off with a Mark II suit and at first had Justin Hammer provide the ordnance upgrade. During his journey as the US Air Force approved power suit guy, his suit got the patriotic upgrade known as Iron Patriot which is another moniker that Rhodey has used, but not before Norman Osborn used it first in a failed attempt at a rebrand. Norman Osborn sporting around in the old Iron Patriot suit might just be the catalyst or after effect of Rhodey trying to rein in rogue Stark tech in the upcoming Armor Wars. We've all become accustomed to the idea of a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, the kid with the red and blue suit and a banter-based coping mechanism. This is a far cry from most people's reactions to spiders in general, where if they see a spider climbing to the vent on their car, they're likely to pull to the side of the road, light the car on fire, and walk away with Thanos on a farm levels of accomplishment. But that's because no matter if he comes in Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, or Tom Holland, Spider-Man comes in adorable. Not so for the being that the Mochi people of Peru worshipped as a spider god. A. A. Pak was a pure nightmare fuel with the arachnid body and a gorgon snake hair head. After an inevitable escape, Osborn decided to start a new Dark Avengers band and gave A. A. Pak a potion that made him a biped, but he still had two extra sets of arms. Should the next Spider-Man movie introduce the idea of spider totems, one of those totems introduced might be A. A. Pak. The less we think about the process that resulted in the Incredible Hulk having a son, the better. Just like Papa, Scar walked the line between good guy and bad guy since he was strong enough to do whatever he wanted. He even sloughed off a chance to become a hero to the universe by setting Galactus up with a meal that would sate him for hundreds of thousands of years. Scar was in the second go at the Dark Avengers, but only as a secret agent for none other than Steve Rogers. As She-Hulk looks to expand the Gammaverse, we might get a peek at just what the Hulk did to fill his time in Sakaar. So one of the Hulk's most notorious sparring partners had his own unknown progeny running around. This time it was the child of Logan and his Japanese wife just after World War II who was killed by the Winter Soldier. Things ended badly with the child nicknamed Dakin or Mongrel eventually killing his adopted mom and his dad killing himself over the whole affair, which is when Romulus stepped back in. Good timing, dude. 
Keeping the bad ideas train rolling, he sent Dakin to Canada to train under and then kill Logan's old teacher. Dakin was Osborn's choice to fill in for his father Logan on the Avengers team, which went all kinds of wrong, forcing Logan to step in as well as a father-son Hulk team. Anywhere Wolverine could enter, so could Dakin. The big news of the week has been the casting announcement for the upcoming Thor Love and Thunder with Russell Crowe taking on the role of Zeus. Can't have a god butcher if there aren't gods to butcher. While this opens the door for a member of the Greek pantheon that has had a heavy role in the MCU, namely Hercules, it does also give Norman Osborn another group of gods to pull from when he needs to replace Thor on his shadow team. We're likely to get introduced to a lot of gods when Thor faces off against Gore the God Butcher in Thor Love and Thunder. Here's hoping we get the MCU version of Ares, which would be a big challenge to the DCEU who already introduced a version of that character. During the first go at the Dark Avengers, it was important to fill the roles pretty directly, like with having Logan's son fill the role of Wolverine. When it came to the role of Captain Marvel, he had a galaxy of Kree to choose from. They're mostly jerks, so he shouldn't have had a problem. Except that he recruited a Kree from another reality that ended up stranded in ours named Novar, who had cockroach powers because, uh, well, why not? The second outing for Captain Marvel will include a newly powered Monica Rambeau, whose time as Captain Marvel predates Carol Danvers, and Doctor Strange will be chasing down a broken multiverse in his second movie, and Spider-Man's third. Plenty of opportunity for the Kree that can do some of the things a cockroach can. Mostly it just made him a Kree super soldier. Even Kree chased that Steve Rogers magic. The captured Norman Osborn found himself incarcerated with an experimental geneticist who earned her striped PJs by killing a room full of special needs folks for funsies. This person was Dr. June Covington, whose chemical and genetic mean streak earned her the title Toxie Doxy. She was given the task of being the Dark Avengers Scarlet Witch. Rather than hooking up with an android, she hooks up with Osborn himself. Their pillow talk had to be dark. There was a lot to forget in the Daredevil motion picture. It was a valiant attempt at bringing the man without fear to live action, but ultimately it just didn't hit. One of the things lost in there was Colin Farrell's wild-eyed Bullseye, who helped set up one of Daredevil's most complicated and heartfelt stories with the assassin Elektra. The man who just can't seem to miss was recruited to be the Dark Avengers version of the Avenger who just can't seem to miss, Hawkeye. Charlie Cox, Daredevil from the Netflix series, was seen on the set of Spider-Man 3, which also contains a multiverse of actors in other roles. Bullseye could easily slip under the radar in the confusion. Robert Reynolds is the embodiment of the idea of someone being their own worst enemy. A meth addict who broke into an abandoned super soldier lab and tried the Sentry formula, which was super effective. As Sentry, he became key in the course of the Marvel Universe, becoming active a year before the Fantastic Four and teaming up with all the big players. Of course, no one remembers any of that because the creation of Sentry also led to the invention of the Void, who would burn the world down just to kill the Sentry. So Reed Richards erased all memory of the Sentry from everyone, even Robert. It didn't hold, and while he was remembering, Osborn bonded with Sentry over mental health struggles and convinced him that the Void wasn't real, and offered to help out Sentry if he joined his new Dark Avengers team. The big question is, will the MCU have the Contessa recruit Norman Osborn for his own superhero team of supervillains? In the aftermath of the blip, there appears to be no shortage of people with bad ideas in charge. Who's going to get the big brain idea of putting the guy with the manic smile in charge? <laughs>